Okay. We are in Hebrews chapter 1 today, aren't we? <laughs> this is video number 2 in our study of Hebrews, and as I said, today we're taking a look at Hebrews chapter 1. Now, how are you today? I hope you're having a good day, and I hope you have enjoyed the beginning of our study of this great letter to the Hebrews. I know that I certainly have. I'm excited about it. I'm sure you are too. Well, in this video, I would like to make a few remarks that are based on Hebrews chapter 1. Now, I think I mentioned in the introductory video of this study that in this book, the author will demonstrate the absolute supremacy of the Christian religion. Well, in chapter 1, he begins sort of a sub-theme of the book, and that sub-theme is the superiority of Jesus Christ. And as you already know, in this chapter, chapter 1, he shows that Jesus is superior to the angels. But before we get to this theme, I want to take another look at what the author says about Jesus in verses 1 through 3. And he says so much in these verses, doesn't he? about our Lord Jesus Christ. What does he tell us in these fantastic verses? He tells us so much about the nature and identity of Jesus Christ. First of all, he tells us that God has spoken to us through his Son. Aren't you glad that God did not leave us in the dark regarding his will? That he has spoken to us, first of all, through the prophets in olden times and now through his Son. He also tells us here that the Son has dignity. Upon what basis? Not only is the Son the creator of the worlds, but being their creator, he is also the undisputed heir of all things. And note what the author says about the Son's relation to the Father. Like no other, like no other, he reflects the glory of God. He is the impress or image of the Father. The two retain their individual identities, but their essential nature is one. He tells us that the Son is the sustainer of the cosmos. I know we ought to let these things sink in and not hurriedly go over them, but think about them. The Son is the sustainer of the cosmos. That is, His is the power that directs its destiny and holds it all together. And, he tells us, that the Son made purification for sins. He took care of our sin problem. His death and his sacrifice secured what could never be attained through Levitical procedures, a satisfactory and enduring cleansing from sin. So, the Son is also Redeemer, Savior. Wow, he says so much in those introductory verses to this letter. Then the author moves to a discussion of the superiority of the Son to angels. Now, to prove that Jesus is greater than the angels may seem wholly unnecessary to us, to us moderns. But the ancient world at that time made much over the angels. The author's proof that Jesus is superior to the angels comes from what? It comes from seven quotations of the Old Testament, five of which are derived from the Psalms. And can't we say here that it is clear in the author's mind that the Old Testament passages he quotes here in the first chapter of Hebrews do not take on their full meaning except in the Messiah. And just here, I've got to pause to underscore something. I want to underscore how the author uses the Old Testament to prove his statements. What is he doing? He is demonstrating the authority of the scriptures, the sacred writings. And may we always look to the scriptures as authoritative, just as the author of Hebrews did. The author shows that in contrast to the angels, the Son has a very special nearness to God, a very special relationship to God the Father, and that the Son holds an unrivaled position among the heavenly host. By nature, he says that the Son is imperishable, verses 10 through 12. That passage will preach, won't it? Now, just a word about angels, and I'm looking now at verse 14. I still remember Raymond Kelsey, one of my mentors, saying 
that all we really know about angels is found in this verse, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. And what do we learn about them? That they are spirits in the divine service. That's about all we know of them. They are all servants. Their function is not to rule, but to serve. And they do this not of their own initiative, but they are sent. And to whom are they sent to serve? The writer says they are sent to serve those who are to inherit salvation. Which, of course, causes me to wonder if the angels serve us today in some special way, and if so, how? And I wish we had more divine revelation on that subject because it would be interesting, wouldn't it? Now, let's apply what the author writes in chapter 1. First of all, he's telling us that Jesus has no rival. None. Not in heaven and not on earth. And just here I can't pass on before we take a look at chapter uh, John chapter 6 and we won't take a look at it because of time but you know what that passage says when the people start to leave Jesus Jesus turns to the disciples the 12 and says will you also go away and Peter is the one who speaks up and he says Lord to whom shall we go you are the holy one of God and we have come to know and believe this and you have the words of eternal life and I've always loved that passage and that thought behind the passage that if we leave Jesus there is no one else to whom we can go who offers us and who gives us what he alone can give and so as I begin to talk about application in Hebrews chapter 1 let me say that we must never leave Jesus there is no one else who can give what he gives he is our Lord he is our master our savior our king we must stay with him. And this too means, this too means that we must never leave the Christian religion. It is superior to all others, if only on the basis that Jesus is superior to all others. And dare I say it, Christianity is exceptional. It has no rivals. As a religion, it has no rivals. It is exceptional. And it is so because Jesus is exceptional. There is no one in history, in our world today, in the world of the past, no one to come. There is no one who has an equal to Jesus. Jesus has no rivals. So again, our charge is to follow Jesus, to love him, to adore him, to worship him, and to decide that forever and for all time we will follow him. And that's how I'm choosing to apply Hebrews chapter 1. May we make this decision and renew our commitment to this decision today that we will follow Jesus for the rest of our lives. God bless you as we enter into chapter 2 where the author is going to start talking about this salvation that Jesus has made possible for us. God bless.